Thank you for joining us for the second Kumi Now online gathering. Before we begin, we have a, a few housekeeping points to cover so that this session can run as smoothly as possible. This session is being broadcast live on Facebook. If you do not wish to appear, please turn off your video feed. We would also love it if you could quickly share the Facebook post on Facebook so that the others may join. We will be muting everyone during the session except those speaking. If you wish to speak, please use the raise hand option under participants or indicate in the chat to Kumi team. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat to message Kumi team privately and uh, we will try to help you with them. Individuals will not be able to unmute themselves. If you wish to ask a question of the speakers, please type it into the chat box. When it comes to questions at the end of the session, we will use questions, uh, questions shared in the chat. We hope that you will find this session interesting and informative. Here is Shada Banura, a member of Sabil's General Assembly, for the welcome and introduction to the sessions. Um, thank you, Rania. Um, I would like like to again welcome everyone to this online gathering. We know that everyone is on Zoom nowadays. Thus, uh, we see this as an opportunity to fulfill the main goal of uh, Kumi now, bringing activists around the world together with the organizations on the ground in Palestine and Israel. Now, we know there are people around the world that want to make a difference. We know there are dozens, even hundreds, of great organizations working for Palestinian rights, both abroad and here in Palestine. But for activists, half a world away, it's daunting to know what to do and how to make a difference. While organizations focus on fulfilling their missions, they find it difficult for numerous reasons to get their message out and find the help they need. They might not have the time or the language skills or the technical expertise to do so. And any attempt at reaching a larger audience has to compete with the latest videos on Facebook or the latest series on Netflix, propaganda from Israel, or simply all of the other problems and worthy causes in the world today. For example, as we've done all the research for Kumi now, we've come across some quiet, remarkable short documentaries that have sat languishing on YouTube for months and months with just a handful of views. How do we get these messages out? Now, this is where Kumi Now comes in. And this is where you come in. Kumi Now has been building stream, trying to make these connections. Everyone likes the idea and everyone acknowledges the need. With these Kumi Now online sessions, we hope to take this network building to the next level, bringing activists and organizations one step closer together and starting a myriad of discussions, either small or large, about how we all work together to multiply our impact. Make no mistake, we are up against a propaganda machine that is well-funded and very well organized. They have dedicated apps, mailing lists, social media actions, letter writing campaigns, so on and so forth. All designed to push a narrative in support of settlement, raising Israeli violations of international law from the record. Well, this is what brings us today and this week. And as we partner with the Peacemakers Trust and answer the question, 
what is Christian Zionism? But first, before we get to Peacemakers Trust, I would like to invite Khafir Abouaid, he's another member of Sabil's General Assembly, to give us an update on what is going on. Khafir, are you with us, please? Um, Javier will be with us in a, in a minute. Um, he's in the waiting room, um, uh, hopefully. I, I'm Omar Harami. In case that Javier does not show up in the coming um, minute, I will, uh, um, I will cover him. So I appreciate your patience. Uh, please, thank you, Shada. But also I will take I will benefit from the opportunity of uh, updating you um, uh, um, on Kumi now. Um, we're very thankful for um, all of the people who are participating, who are registering, and who are actively promoting um, uh, the sessions. Last, last week, we had close to 200 participants who took part in the Kumi session and added to the numbers of people who have really joined us from um, different parts um, uh, who have followed us on YouTube and Facebook. So the movement is building up slowly, um, uh, and we hope that it will continue um, uh, to expand. Um, any update on Javier? So um, my recommendation, because we know Javier is present and he has plenty of information to share, um, if is it okay to move now to Stephen Sizer, Reverend Dr. Stephen Sizer, um, a founder and a director um, of, and the co-director, co-founder and the director of the Peacemakers Trust. Um, please, Reverend Dr. It's a delight to uh, be with you and to share a little bit more about the work of Peacemaker Trust. Uh, we founded the charity three years ago um, with the purpose of um, being catalysts for peacemaking, especially where minorities are persecuted, uh, where justice is denied, human rights are suppressed, or reconciliation is needed. And uh, we took uh, the five marks of mission, which have been um, embraced by the mainstream denominations as a definition of, uh, of mission to include evangelism, discipleship, compassion, justice, and creation care. And uh, in the last uh, three years, we've been active in um, evangelism training in uh, Morocco, Lebanon, and in Egypt, <clears throat> uh, discipleship training in Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda and uh, compassion ministry, particularly among uh, asylum seekers and refugees here in the UK, and uh, justice issues, uh, particularly in Palestine, and also in Iran, uh, and uh, other countries in the Middle East, China and Australia. And then we've been working with the Joint Advocacy Initiative in Palestine, helping to plant olive trees as a um, as an example of our commitment to creation care. So over the last uh, three years, since we founded the organization, the charity, we've been working in 17 different countries. Um, but today's focus is on one key issue, which is the issue of justice uh, in relation to Palestine. And we're going to be spending a little bit of time exploring this question, what is uh, Christian Zionism? I want to show you how destructive this movement is uh, politically and give you a taste for its uh, theological basis. If you want to access um, more information about Christian Zionism on the homepage of my website, stephensarsa.com, you'll find a, a, an expanded outline of uh, the presentation I'm giving this afternoon, along with access to my books, the, the red book, Christian Zionism, uh, was the, the basis of about 25 years uh, study and led to a PhD looking at the historical roots, the theological basis and political consequences of Christian Zionism as a movement. And then my second book is a, a lighter, easier read, which looks more at how we deconstruct Christian Zionism from the Bible. 
and I'm going to be doing a little bit of that with you this afternoon. Um, but a good definition of Christian Zionism provided by Donald Wagner in his book, Anxious for Armageddon. He said, Christian Zionism is a movement within Protestant Christianity that views the modern state of Israel as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, thus deserving our unconditional economic, moral, political, and theological support. Now, we're not going to have time to look at the historical roots. They begin around 1809 when the first explicitly Christian organization was founded working with Jewish people, the, the London Jew Society. Um, uh, so we don't have time to explore what's happened over the last 200 years, but we're going to major on the contemporary manifestations of Christian Zionism. I'll just give you a couple of uh, quotes to give you a flavor. Jerry Falwell said when, uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. said when Donald Trump was elected, I think evangelicals have found their dream president reuniting Israel with America. And when asked, is Trump like uh, the biblical Queen Esther who saved the Jews from Persia, uh, Mike Pompeo said, well, as a Christian, I certainly believe that's possible. And uh, if you're in any doubt as to the influence of Christian Zionism, then who better than Benjamin Netanyahu to, uh, to explain it? He said, I don't believe that the Jewish state and modern Zionism would have been possible without Christian Zionism. I let that just sink in and let me explain why I believe he's saying, uh, why he said this. The Pew Forum for Religion suggests there are 20 to 40 million Christian Zionists. The Unity Coalition for Israel boasts of 40 million active members. And uh, my, my surveys would show that 90 to 95 percent of Zionists in the world are Christians. So when you think Zionism, think Christian Zionism, vastly outweighs the number of Jewish Zionists. The Pew Forum for Religion found recently that 25% of American Christians believe it's their responsibility to support the nation of Israel. And when you look at white evangelicals, that goes up to 63%. Uh, John Hagee uh, is one of the leaders of this movement. Um, he is the founder of Christians United for Israel. He said this recently. The sleeping giant of Christian Zionism has awakened. There are 50 million Christians standing up and applauding Israel. Think of our future together. 50 million evangelicals joining in common cause with 5 million Jewish people in America on behalf of Israel is a match made in heaven. And that's without perhaps another 50 million or more Christian Zionists in other countries. Let me give you a flavor for their political agenda because it is a deeply uh, destructive movement. The first element of their agenda is to lobby the White House and Congress on behalf of Israel. And these are some of the organizations active in doing that on a daily basis. Second element of their agenda is funding the emigration of Jews, particularly from Russia and Ethiopia, to live in Palestine. So the International Christian Embassy, for example, will identify Jewish communities in Russia, they will pay off debts, they will help them gather the documentation they need, then they will transport them, feed them, clothe them, and resettle them within, invariably, within the settlements in the occupied territories. Uh, the third element of their, uh, their agenda is supporting the illegal set settlements. So the Christian Friends of Israeli Communities, for example, will help uh, churches in the West adopt a settlement. And when you re realize that some of these settlements have maybe 50 or 100 people, and the churches have 20 or 30,000 members, you see where the power lies. And they were active in, uh, in, uh, in lobbying for the US President uh, Donald Trump to recognize the settlements as integral to Israel. The fourth element, as we know more, more recently, is the lobby to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. This began in 1980 with the founding of the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem, and that lobby to move the embassy to Jerusalem is, is very strategic because when the U.S. has recognized um, uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel by moving its embassy there, it essentially is the end of the two-state solution. And Donald Trump made it one of his campaign uh, uh, priorities to do so, and as we know recently, that embassy was moved 
to Jerusalem. Fifth element is you'll maybe find this surprising, but within Christian Zionist circles, there is a support for the temple to be rebuilt. And Gershon Solomon is a celebrity in many uh, Christian churches in America. He said this in the London Times. He said, we must have a war. The Messiah will not come by himself. We should bring him by fighting. And they believe that the rebuilding of the Jewish temple must take place before Jesus returns. Randall Price's books are uh, just some of the books that are available that would explain where to send your money, uh, which organizations to support if you really want to see the temple rebuilt. Saddest of all, there is a strong denigration of Islam and the peace process within Christian Zionism, and Franklin Graham is typical of that. In, uh, in the Charlotte Observer, uh, a few years ago, he said, the Arabs will not be happy until every Jew is dead. They hate the state of Israel. They all hate the Jews. God gave the land to the Jews. The Arabs will never accept that. I find that deeply, deeply disturbing. And finally, their, their view of the future is very pessimistic. It's apocalyptic. And these are the kinds of books that keep many Christian bookshops open. Um, again, back to John Hagee, he said this recently, it is 1938, Iran is Germany, Ahmadinejad is the new Hitler. We must stop Iran's nuclear threat and stand boldly with Israel. Iran, he said, is a clear and present danger to the United States of America and Israel, and that it's time for our country to consider a military preemptive strike against Iran if they do not yield to diplomacy. I find it hard to believe a Christian leader would make such a provocative statement, but he's one of many. So this is their political agenda. Uh, and again, if you want to develop that, then please go to my website and you'll find a lot more resources. Um, the heads of churches in Jerusalem uh, in, in, I think it was 2008, adopted a statement on Christian Zionism, which came out of a Seville conference addressing the subject, in which they roundly um, rejected Christian Zionism. They said this, we categorically reject Christian Zionist doctrines as a false teaching that corrupts the biblical message of love, justice, and reconciliation. We further reject the alliance of Christian Zionist leaders and organizations with elements in the governments of Israel and the United States that are presently imposing their unilateral preemptive borders and domination over Palestine. Rather than condemn the world to the doom of Armageddon, we call upon everyone to liberate themselves from ideologies of militarism and occupation. Instead, let them pursue the healing of the nations. And that was signed by the then four heads of the churches in Jerusalem. But in the time I have left, I want us to look briefly at their political base, uh, their religious basis, their, their theological foundation for that political agenda. What is the relationship between Israel and the church? And I'm going to introduce you to seven common assumptions which Christian Zionists make. Uh, the first is that God blesses those who bless Israel and curses those who curse Israel. Secondly, the Jews are God's chosen people. Thirdly, the promised land was given by God to the Jewish people as an everlasting inheritance. Four, that Jerusalem is the exclusive and divided eternal capital of the Jewish people. Fifth, the Jewish temple must be rebuilt. Six, believers will be raptured to heaven before the end time battle of Armageddon. And seven, God has a separate plan for the Jewish people apart from the church. These are the seven common assumptions held by many Christian Zionists. And I liken them to a balloon of hot air. How many pins do you need to burst a balloon? Well, I'll give you seven. Um, seven biblical answers. And there's a, a, a simple outline which you can download a PDF uh, from the homepage of my website. It's called Seven Biblical Answers. And uh, please have a look at that if you want to explore the subject further. You can access the content of my book, uh, Zion's Christian Soldiers, which looks at each of those assumptions in more detail. But let's just briefly give you a flavor and show you how easy it is to burst that balloon. Where does this idea come from that God blesses those who bless Israel and curses those who curse Israel? It goes back to a promise God made to Abraham in Genesis 12. 
He said, I'll make you into a great nation and I'll bless you. I will make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The first observation we can make is that that promise was made to Abraham and no one else. No one else is mentioned in that, uh, in that promise. The blessing that would flow to other peoples is a result of the blessing God gave to Abraham. Another promise he made in Genesis 22 said, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And through your seed, all nations on earth will be blessed. Now, Christian Zionists say, aha, that's the Jewish people. And the world is blessed through the Jewish people. Well, a fundamental uh, principle of biblical interpretation is if a word like that is ambiguous, you look at other passages where that word is used to see how it should be understood. And in Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul explains it. He says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say unto seeds many, many people, but to your seed meaning one person who was Christ. So we read the Old Testament through the grid of the new, not the other way around. And so the seed in Genesis is Jesus. And then the apostle goes one stage further. And he says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the promise God made to Abraham is fulfilled through Jesus, and that blessing flows to those who recognize Jesus. Do you see how easy it was to burst that balloon? Let's look at the Jewish people. Now, it almost sounds anti-Semitic to question whether the Jewish people, the, ra the racial descendants of Abraham, are God's chosen people. But it's not actually what the Old Testament says. Um, Isaiah 56, for example, God says, let no foreigners who bound themselves to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. I just think about that sentence. The Lord is speaking and he says, let no foreigners who bound themselves to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. So if the Lord did not want foreigners to think he would exclude them, why would they think it? The obvious answer is they thought they would be excluded because the Lord's people were doing the excluding. They were kicking the, the, the foreigners out of the temple. And that's why Jesus specifically quotes this passage when he kicks out the money changers, because they're set up in the court of the Gentiles and they were inhibiting and exploiting the Gentiles from worshiping the one true God. Let me give you just one more example. In the story of Esther, chapter 8, and it's the origin of the Feast of Purim, it says, In every province and in every city to which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews. But then notice what it says. And many people of other nationalities became Jews. These were people who were not the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. They were other nationalities. And it says many people. So it means that within the Old Testament, the Jewish people was a term used to describe the people of God made up of many ethnic communities. Again, the New Testament says the same thing. The word chosen is only used of those in the New Testament, neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, circumcised or uncircumcised, they are all one in Christ. They are God's chosen people, says the apostle. Again, you see how easy it is to, to burst the balloon. And one more. The promised land was given by God to the Jewish people as an everlasting inheritance. Well, the origin of this idea comes from Genesis 15. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. And Theodor Herzl drew a map uh, based on that verse. And here it is. But in the book of uh, Leviticus, it says this, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Now, how do we marry those two passages together? It sounds like they contradict each other. They don't. 
The difference between the Genesis passage, which says, I give you this land, and the Leviticus passage, which says it's my land, is the difference between freehold and leasehold. If you're buying a property, you're buying a house, it's very important you know whether you're buying the freehold or the leasehold. The freehold says you're buying the house and you're buying the land underneath it. Leasehold says you're buying the house, but you pay rent because the land belongs to somebody else. And that's what was happening here. The Lord allowed his people into the land because he said, it's mine. Don't you forget that. And you remain foreigners and strangers. In fact, within the Hebrew scriptures, when they came back out of exile, God explicitly says in Ezekiel 47, distribute the land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel, allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the foreigner residing among you. Consider them native-born Israelites. Along with you, they are to be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe a foreigner resides, there you are to give them their inheritance. Now, when God says something once in a verse, it's important. When God says something twice in two consecutive verses, it must be very important. But why would God say the same thing three times in three consecutive verses? Share the land with the foreigners. Why does he have to say it three times? Well, simply because they didn't want to share the land with the foreigners. This is what the Old Testament has to say. The promised land was to be shared. Again, we burst the bubble. What is the relationship between Israel and the church? Well, Zionism likes to view the Bible as their exclusive domain, like a, a can of Sprite. And they major on what appear to be exclusive promises. But the fact is the Bible contains many inclusive promises, and that's like a can of Coke. Now, it's not a, about arguing one against the other. It's about blending the two together. What happens when you put Coke into Sprite? Changes color. And when you've added, for example, the surrounding nations who became Jews into the Jewish community, you can't go back to a racial exclusivity. When you've shared the inheritance of the land with the foreigners residing among you, you can't go back and claim it's all yours exclusively. So it's a one-way street. Prophetic and biblical revelation is a flow of biblical history. You can't reverse the trend. Zionists are trying to go back the wrong way up a one-way street. You cannot go back to racial and political exclusivity. It's race or faith. Race or faith. So the seven common assumptions, we've only tasted a sample of, of how easy it is to destroy the theological basis of Christian Zionism. Do download the, the outline. Do check out my website for more information. And go to ChristianZionism.org. It's another very helpful website with a lot more resources. And now it's my privilege to introduce you to one of the trustees of Peacemakers, Tanas al uh, is the regional manager uh, for Europe, Middle East, and North Africa for the Church Mission Society. Tanas, over to you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sizer. Um, I'm really, what I want to do today, is just share about my personal story, uh, being a Palestinian uh, who lived in the U.S. Uh, back in uh, Beis Sahur and also in other countries like Romania and, and face different aspects of the Christian Zionism. Um, when I grew up, uh, you know, I love my Bible. It's something my family are into it and I, I loved reading it and I wanted to know more about my faith. Uh, but I was told always that, you know, we have to, uh, the Old Testament for the Jews, the, the New Testament for the Christians. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't take that, but I remember going to the U.S. And uh, when I was in the U.S. study in the university, I was 18 years old. And I got introduced to Christian Zionism. And three things that I want to talk about that actually affected my life, and I think it affects a lot of Palestinians. It's not just me. And it does scar you big time. The first one is that they deny my faith, my identity, and my struggle. 
uh, during the first intifada, uh, as I was a student in the United States, in a Christian university, uh, I was really struggling. It was a very difficult time, and I was going through the dormitory, and I saw a sign on one of the uh, uh, rooms saying, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So I got really excited. I thought, oh, somebody's praying. So I knock on the door, I go in and uh, talk to the guy. I said, hey, this is wonderful. When are you guys going to pray? I would love to pray with you. And let me tell you about my story. Um, you know, my mom and dad live in Beit Sahur. I have not been in touch with them for a uh, for, uh, for long time, partly because they don't have a phone. They have to go to uh, Tantur to be able to call me, but because of the situation, they cannot. And I'm sharing all that. And the guy just looked at me and he smiled and politely answered. He said, yeah, but we are only praying for Israel and the Jewish people because uh, they're the one who's suffering and, and they are chosen people. And I'm like, what? But, you know, they are very strong compared to, to the Palestinians. We are really going through a hard time. Why don't you pray for us? Well, the Bible tells us to pray for, the, for Israel. And that really hit me hard because I couldn't understand why. I mean, how come they cannot see there is some suffering happening. The second one, they deny my faith. Um, I remember visiting my uh, classmates home and uh, a lot of times he introduced me. This is my Palestinian friend he, from Bethlehem. And the first question they'll ask me, so are you a converted Jew or a converted Muslim? And like, I don't even exist. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not there. They, they don't understand that I actually, there's a Christian in Palestine, or they don't understand that we have suffering. Uh, it's just like, it's gone. We're not there. And that's really difficult because as a Palestinian growing in occupation, my identity has already been marked big time because we were not allowed to say Palestinian. We, ha we always hear in the news, Arab, Arab, Arab. And we're always being told to say Arab, not Palestinian. So we were scared of it. We shouldn't even use it. I remember having a t-shirt with Palestine on it and an olive tree. We had to put it inside out if we go through the airport so they cannot see it. And, and that really affects you. And now you have a Christian who's supposed to be your brother and, uh, or sister telling that they even deny that you are existing. It's really even harder. Uh, see, many, for many of them, they don't even consider me a Christian, actually. Uh, because they said to me, if you were a real Christian, then you should leave the land and give it to the Jews because you've been a, you are a stumbling block for, the, for God's plan. And famously, the International Christian Embassy actually said that to many uh, because they, they are the one who knows if we are a Christian or not. And apparently, I didn't even know that, but they actually judged. The second part that was really difficult is that justice is not an issue when it comes to Israel. Everything is justified because it's God's plan. Um, I remember speaking uh, out in, in the US in a conference about democracy and, and about uh, reconciliation. And one day became very upset. So why are you doing that? Everybody wants to kill the, uh, the Jews and the Arabs are all in it. So we don't need to do anything about it. We need to just to support Israel. And I'm like, but this is not really true. But the problem what happened is, and like uh, Dr. Sizer said, when Franklin Graham, a, a very known Christian leader, say that the Arabs want to kill the Jews and get rid of them, what happened? They start seeing me as a threat. They start seeing me as, as somebody should be away. That creates fear. When you stereotype people, that creates fear. And so the way they react is unbelievable because they're so scared of us. We become really, uh, I don't know, very dangerous to them, which is really strange. Uh, but that's part because the, I would say, brainwashed sometimes about how we, we are, who we are. Um, just last week, I, somebody asked me if I was an American Mexican. I said, no, I'm actually a Palestinian. And he goes, oh, so you're a terrorist. It, and he may be joking, but the way he said it, it showed you how it is embedded in their mind. So that's something, you know, justice, very important. The last thing, which is, um, if you speak about the reality of your life, then you're anti-Semitic. I'm at a funeral one time, and uh, one guy asked me where I'm from. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm from Bethlehem, I'm Palestinian. We said, oh, is it true that all the Palestinians are leaving because the Muslims are persecuting them? I looked at the guy and said, I just came from there. I'm, I, I don't know what you're talking about, but a lot of Christians are leaving 
because of economic situation, because the occupation make it very difficult. And he looked at me and said, oh, you're one, one of those anti-Semitic people. What are you going to tell a person like that? What are you going to tell a person? It's very difficult because, I mean, I'm just telling the reality of my story, and this is what I got. So the problem with Christian Zionism is that we accept, we expect them to be people who will love us because that's what God is all about. It's about love. God is about justice. And instead, we see seen that their eyes closed, their ears are closed, and they want to hear anything about the Palestinians because we are a stumbling block in God's plan. And that breaks your heart. That makes it very difficult for me to say I'm a Christian. It makes me scared to say sometimes because when I hear people acting like that. So my thinking, my, my heart is I want peace. I want reconciliation. And uh, I want change. So let us learn how to love instead of that hate. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Sizer and Dr. al -Kassis. Um, Dr. al -Kassis, that really re resonated with me and I think really reson would resonate with many Palestinian Christians who uh, feel that way very often, um, that, that piece of their identity that's constantly being questioned. Um, and so th thank you so much for that. Um, we'd like to move into a question and answer period. So if you do have any questions, please type them into the chat box um, and we'll start moving through those questions. So we had one question come in uh, as Reverend Dr. Sizer uh, was speaking. So I'm going to read it up here. Um, and the question was about Zionism within Islam. Um, and the person is asking whether that is a phenomenon that's happening within Islam as well. Um, you know, and to, if you're able to comment on you know, comparing the two, um, the, whether it's, it's gained any traction within uh, Islam. I think we just have to unmute. Yep. Oh, there we Thank go. You. I'm I'm on. Can you repeat the question for me, please? Yes, of course. So, um, the question is about whether there's uh, Zionism uh, within Islam, um, whether it's there's a phenomenon or a growth of uh, Zionism within Islam at all, and and if you could compare, um, you know, how much how prevalent it might be in Islam versus in Christianity. Um, I'm not familiar with. Uh, there being any Zionism within uh, Islam at all. Uh, there are elements within Zionism, uh, within Islam that is a mirror image of Zionism, uh, idea of supremacy, idea of extremism, violence as a redemptive uh, uh, force. Uh, but I'm not aware of any Muslims who regard themselves as Zionists. Um, there is a very, very small uh, minority of Palestinians who've accepted the occupation and accept uh, the Zionist agenda um, and that's because they have been uh, influenced by Christian Zionist theology or they are employed by Christian Zionist organizations. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for that and um, Dr. al Kassis, I'll give you a, if you wanted to comment as well Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm agree with uh, what uh, Stephen said. There was another one I would like to comment on, if that's okay, if you don't mind. What, what John Haycox asked a question, how do you keep hope? Um, and, I, and I want him to understand that many Palestinians actually, he, he asked that for Stephen, but as a Palestinian, we live by hope. Uh, uh, when people have to demolish, they say, God is good. When somebody goes uh, die, they say, God is good. And we have to live that positivity. We have to live hope that things will change and love will prevail and that we could change things by actually doing it ourselves. So I just wanted to, to get that across. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. So there's another question asking about, similar to the topic of hope, um, asking apart from prayer, can you give us ideas of how we can help and what we can do to be able to stand in solidarity with the Palestinians and try to speak out about these issues? Well, first I would say, um, become familiar with the resources available on the Sabil website, the Kairos website, 
um, christianzionism.org, um, you know, have a look at the outline and become familiar with um, the passages of the Bible which give us hope that Tanas talks about, that explain that God's people are always intended to be inclusive, um, that land was to be shared, that God's good gifts are to be shared. So become familiar with how to handle the Bible accurately. I think that's the best way to refute Christian Zionism because they like to believe it's their book. They like to believe it's, it's their mandate. And if you can show that the foundation, as I said, if you, if you burst that balloon with one pin, you've taken away the basis of their theology. So become familiar with how to answer it and the political issues and the other issues um, flow from it. So showing solidarity uh, with, with Kairos, with Sabil, with uh, other Christian organizations, particularly in Palestine, uh, visiting the land, visiting, getting out there, spending time. I mean, I, I really enjoy getting out there and, and planting olive trees or picking the olives in the autumn with JAI. There are many ways in which we can go out and, and support and work with our Palestinian friends. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, now, there's another, another question about the role that the Catholic Church uh, plays in Christian Zionism and what role Catholics are, are playing in that. I'm not that familiar with, uh, with Roman Catholic teaching other than uh, some excellent books by Dr. Michael Pryor, who looked at the Bible and colonialism and uh, was a strong critic of Zionism. Um, within the Zionist, uh, Christian Zionist uh, spectrum, if you like, from um, the, the Orthodox and Catholic through to the evangelical end, the, the influence and power of Zion, Christian Zionism is at this end, the evangelical end. But in the middle, let's put the Anglicans in the middle, um, the middle of the road, the, 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 the European denominations, the Methodists, the Anglicans, Lutheran and so on, they're in the middle. They acquiesce to Zionism for two reasons, guilt and the carrot, the carrot and the stick. Uh, uh, guilt for the Holocaust and fear of being accused of being anti-Semitic. Those are two very powerful uh, forms of self-censorship. And so there is implicit Christian Zionism that isn't articulated in the way I've tried to introduce it, that isn't pounding the Bible and saying, this is our book, this is our mandate for Zionism. In the middle, is what I call soft Christian Zionism that acquiesces and accepts the reality, talks about two states, but won't get involved in BDS, won't campaign on behalf of Palestine, and it acquiesces to the Zionist agenda, I think is as bad as the explicit uh, Christian Zionism I've talked about. Thank you, and I think, I think you touched uh, a little bit on what some folks were asking in the questions around Christian Zionists in Britain and Europe, uh, whether you could comment on their their size. So I think you touched a little bit on that. Do you have, but if there's anything you'd like to elaborate with regards to that? Um, yes, I mean, the Christian Zionism in Europe is influential in Sweden, Holland, Germany in particular. It tends to be more prevalent within the Protestant uh, countries with a Protestant heritage rather than Catholic, so it's not so strong in Italy or Spain or France. Um, in Holland, it's linked to dual covenant theology. You know, the Dutch Africana Church in South Africa justified apartheid on the basis of the Bible. And so there's a parallel between apartheid in South Africa and the colonization of Palestine. And so the, the Dutch uh, Dutch Reformed Church has accepted a dual covenant theology that says God has two plans, one for the church and one for Israel. So that's a form of Christian Zionism. Germany, I think Christian Zionism is strong there, again, because of the consequences of Nazism, fascism, and the Holocaust. It's almost a, a compensation um, for the terrible way in which Europeans treated the Jewish people. It kind of gives them uh, gives them a pass 
rather than holding Israel accountable as we do Iran or other countries uh, in terms of international law. And, and um, like one, of the, one of the things you mentioned, of course, you mentioned is South Africa, but I'm wondering, one of the questions is asking about West Africa, um, and uh, the, the person is making an observation uh, that Zionism is, uh, or evangelical uh, Christianity is starting to be welcomed by a lot of the English churches in West Africa, um, and that you know, Netanyahu is actually working in overdrive to court these African nations. Um, and whether you could, you could comment on that, if you have any observations about that. Yes. The, again, if we take this end of the spectrum, which is the evangelical end, the, the dominant churches that um, lie behind Christian Zionism are Pentecostalism and uh, the house church movement, the, the prosperity gospel the uh, people like uh, Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, Rodney Howard Brown, Morris Cerullo, um, the, the, the television evangelists, uh, because they emphasize a prosperity gospel. If you support Israel, God will make you prosperous. If you give to their church, you'll be healthy and wealthy. And it's sad, but it's those churches that have strongly influenced the spread of Christianity in countries like Nigeria and other West African countries. So yes, there is a, there's a link, if you like, a bloodstream within which this theology is penetrating churches in Africa. Mm -hmm. And, and Latin seen, America too. Yeah, well, I was just about to, to comment on that because a few questions have come in asking for Latin American or Spanish material, uh, citing the like, huge growth of Christian Zionism in Latin America. And so I see some folks have shared uh, some great resources, but if you, I think it, well, it's, it's very similar in terms yeah. of this book is in Spanish. It is available in Spanish, and this one is being translated at the moment into Spanish. So we hope to to work on that in the next few years. Wonderful. If Thank you go to ChristianZionism.org, I believe there is some Spanish material there too. Um, now there's, there's a question and this one I think always comes up, um, but this question is, do you think a one state solution is viable? Um, so uh, this is, I think, an, an important question. <laughs> I think it is. I think it is very easily. Uh, let, me, let me give you a diagram um, to explain this. Israel is like a, a child that's gone to see its grandparents and it's got its hand in the sweet jar and it wants three sweets. It wants three sweets. It's got its hand in the jar and it can't get its hand out because it's greedy. It can only have two sweets. Israel wants to be a democracy. It wants to be a democracy, okay? But it also wants all the land. It wants to annex the land, but it also wants to be a Jewish state. It can't have all three. If it gave up the West Bank, two-state solution, it could be a Jewish democracy and Palestinian Israelis can live within a Jewish majority or they can go and live in Palestine. Palestinian settlers, you know, the Jewish settlers can live in under a Palestinian uh, government or they can go and live in Israel. That's a two-state solution. But will Israel give up the settlements? Will it give up the annexation? No. What's the alternative? give up being a Jewish state and have the one state solution. Treat Palestinians and Israelis as equal citizens. Uh, is Israel gonna give up being a Jewish state? No. So what's the alternative? It's not a democracy. Now I personally favor the one state solution because the two state solution is dead. There's no way Israel's gonna give up the settlements or the annexation. So um, Jeff Halper, who's speaking next week on Kumi Now, is a strong advocate for the one state, one democratic state solution. And I think that is the way to go. Um, I, I think it's, it's encouraging to see how uh, Palestinian Israelis are using their democratic rights, their right to vote, to influence um, Israeli politics. And I think that that is what the, the West and other parts of the world should do. Support the BDS movement, put pressure on Israel to share the land, and give Palestinians uh, self-determination either in their own state or equal rights within uh, the one state. 
Thank you. Dr. Elkasis, do you have any, any comments on this? I, I saw you wanted to comment on this earlier as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, I would uh, agree 100%. I mean, if you look at the two-state solution, it's impossible right now. I mean, then our country will look like a cheese, uh, a Swiss cheese with all the different holes in it. Uh, look, the whole idea of having a country is about having uh, dignity, having honor, having a, a way to be able to prosper, have freedom. Uh, and this is what Palestinians want. They want to be treated as normal human, having the freedom to live, in peace and prosper and move forward. Um, and I think if, if Israel will agree to accept the diversity and not just saying, you know, Jewish, then I think there's possibility. But as long as you look by race and look around the world now what's happening with the whole, um, you know, Black Lives Matter, it's exactly the same thing. When people start thinking about just race and this is what you want me to recognize. So, for Israel, the most important thing they wanted from the Palestinian is to recognize them as a Jewish state. They don't care about anything else. They just want us to recognize a Jewish state, to make us a minority that is not even exists in a sense, uh, to get rid of us in that way. So I am for peace. I am for one state solution. Uh, I want to live with my neighbor in love and peace and hope. This is what all Palestinians want. And if you actually ask Palestinians, they will tell you, I just want to be able to provide food to my family and live a normal life, to be able to drive to the sea and swim when I can, to be able to go pray in Jerusalem without having to go through checkpoints, simple things, to be able just to travel anywhere without getting stopped and treated as a terrorist. I'm always nominated, randomly selected for security no matter where I go. It's wonderful. I wish it was the lottery. I would have been very rich by now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Elkasis and Dr. Uh, Dr. Sizer for, for your answers. And thank you to everyone for your great questions. Um, we are going to stay on the call for about half an hour afterwards, um, where more of your questions can be answered if we haven't gotten to them yet. But thank you all so much. Uh, we'd like to move on to a short prayer. Um, thank you, Lord, for the work of the Peacemaker Trust. You have raised up your children from all the families of the earth. Help us to show love for one another and to work together for peace and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Amen. Now, I'd like to invite uh, Javier Abouaid, another member of Sabil's General Assembly, to give us an update on what's going on. Thank you, Yara, and thank you all for being here. It's, it's, it's really beautiful to see so many people that are interested in what's happening here uh, to us and all uh, your very interesting questions. Just, I just want to make a very small point with regards to the previous uh, discussion. I think we have to be careful with the, with the statements uh, that are made. When, when people say that the two-state solution is dead because settlements will not go anywhere, people are assuming that Israel will continue being treated as a state above the law and that no country is going to take action on that matter. So I think it's important because that's a moment of truth for the international community, what we are going to talk here as a whole, whether Israel is declared as a state that will continue being treated as a state above the law, and then of course, settlements are going to stay here, or a state, Israel is being held to the same principles that other states are being held, and then they are not going to have an incentive to continue occupying Palestinian land. And as Professor Caesar said, uh, and as our good friend is going to speak next week, at the end of the day, it's an issue of rights. Uh, whether it's a one-state solution or a two-state solution, it's an issue of rights. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing that, that I think, and here I'm, I'm getting into, into our point uh, on, on, on what's going on now, the other reason why we have to be careful is that what Israel is doing in occupied territory as defined by the 67 border it are, uh, in some cases, war crimes. In the case of annexation, it's a crime of aggression. And if we are just to erase the 67 border, there is no international legal prosecution for what Israel is doing. So once again, I think we have to be a bit careful with, uh, with the terms that are being used, regardless on uh, the beautiful idea of having freedom and equality for uh, everyone. Now, if we want to talk about what's going on now, we can just say what happened today. Four Palestinian homes were demolished 
today, the four of them uh, in Jerusalem. You have one home demolished in Naktur, another one in Beth Hanina, Ras al Amud, and, and Mudar, which is to the north of Jerusalem. And around 20 Palestinians were detained today also by uh, Israeli forces. Let's remember that there are about 7,000 Palestinian political prisoners in Israeli jails, uh, hundreds of them detained without any charges against, including children, including women. Now, this is all happening in a context, a very concrete context, which is it, the calls of the Israeli government to start a process of annexation of occupied territory in July the 1st. And then uh, we've heard of many churches in the US and Canada that have been very active in terms of calling upon their governments to oppose this. But in the case of the US, and I think uh, here is where we are applying everything we learned from Professor uh, Caesar in his uh, presentation. This is part of a plan which is presented by the US. And this plan is basically that some people, the US actually ironically refers to it as a vision of peace. Uh, we refer to it just, just as an annexation plan. And basically what this, what this plan, if, if, if you go carefully into all its points, uh, it's a plan that basically calls for the implementation of this Christian Zionist vision to the extent that even uh, the Haram Sharif or Aqsa Mosque compound uh, that some people refer to as the Temple Mount, uh, they, they've gone to the extent of even suggesting that it could change the status quo of this place calling for uh, prayers of other religions to take place there, which of course it's going to affect, I mean, so those of you who have been here, you understand the sensitivity of the status quo of the holy sites. Uh, if they start throwing ideas like this in Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, then something like this could happen at the Holy Sepulchre and then, then just keep going. So it's, 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 it's really a, a moment whereby it's no longer about Palestinian rights only, it's about uh, a rules-based world order. And that's what the US administration with Israel are challenging now. So uh, as we are getting closer to July the 1st, some people are asking uh, whether uh, July the 1st is going to be the date when Israel announces annexation. Uh, the question is, we don't know. I'm sorry, the answer is we don't know. Uh, but July the 1st is the moment when they can start, uh, at least in terms of Israeli uh, principles uh, with with this. What is it going to mean here? And and, and here it's, it's I think the scariest part, especially for those who are coming here in pilgrimage. It means the consolidation of the separation between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. And uh, when we are talking about annexation, some of the areas that are, that are going to be first annexed, we're talking about basically all the area left for Bethlehem, all the green areas of Bethlehem. Some of you have heard of the Kremazan Valley. Some of you have heard of uh, Al Makrur Valley. Uh, all of them are entitled for annexation, and it's mainly land owned either by Palestinian Christians or by churches. Um, that's also one of the areas where Christian Zionist groups actually does going to. The, there is a conference Israel organizes, I think, for three years now on Christian media, which is basically Christian Zionist media, it's very well organized in Jerusalem. They take them on tours, and one of the stops they get. Uh, is in the wall in the area nearby and Slayeb or the Gilo illegal set settlement, which is where they are going to proceed with uh, annexation. Now, just the last point <coughs> uh, to be made. Um, it's very important that uh, regardless on their positions, once again, on uh, one state or the two state solution to uh, stop annexation and to do everything possible mm -hmm. to uh, stop this process. It's, it's not only about uh, international law, it's also about being able to keep the hope of people here. And the consequences of annexation, some people say, well, Israel already has the land, so what's going to be the big difference? No, there will be a huge difference. Israel will, will gain more tools based on their own legislation to confiscate more Palestinian land and to continue this process of forced displacement of Palestinians that's happening now. And I think here uh, I conclude just trying to give some context to our discussion. Thank you so much for that, Javier. Uh, it's a really important update and it's great to have um, that voice from, from people on the ground and to help contextualize um, annexation because uh, I've definitely heard uh, people uh, echo that sentiment of, you know, they already have the land and so what? And so that's very important. And thank you for sharing that. 
Um, I'd like to move into a Kumi action now, um, because while it's great for us to learn about Christian Zionism and its effects on Palestine, we at Kumi now believe that, is, that knowledge is just the beginning. The reason that Kumi now exists is to empower people to act on their knowledge. With this in mind, we've created a single advocacy action that anyone around the globe can participate in. It will be posted in the chat and is also available on the website. This week, we'd like you to speak with, your, with a representative of your school library or community library, encouraging them to stock more digital and physical resources and books that counteract the harmful politics and theology of Christian Zionism. Ask them to stock the books mentioned in the additional resources section of this entry or buy one of these books yourselves and donate, donate it to a library or pass it on to a friend. Take a picture of the books you've requested and or donated and share them on social media. Include a link to this page of the Kumi Now website along with the hashtags Kumi Now and Kumi 34. Uh, Reverend Dr. Sizer, do you have any thoughts about the Kumi Now action or other ways that people watching the session can apply what they've learned today? Um, only to reinforce what I've said earlier, which is, um, you know, this is, the, this is the distillation of 25 years work on four pages. I hope I've, I've given people a taster for how easy it is to deconstruct the theology of Christian Zionism. And that's, that's what I would urge people to do, to download the text, familiarize yourself with the passages. And there is a video uh, on, on my homepage. It's a 40 minute video and it takes you through each of those seven assumptions and deconstructs each of them. So for me, that, that's where my, my, my priority would be. Uh, become familiar with the material and, and deconstruct it. Don't be afraid of Christian Zionism. Be ready to challenge those. As you heard um, um, Tanas do, you know, he, he, you, you, you get people say stupid things, point out how stupid they are, and you've converted someone. At, at that um, Sabeel conference we had a few years ago on Christian Zionism, I said, hands up if you used to be a Christian Zionist. Half the hands went up. It's a one-way street. People come out of this theology when they realize it's, it's, a, it's a delusion, it's a counterfeit. They don't go back the other way. So um, for me, that's the most important thing because then it influences how we view the political agenda. It helps expose the destructive nature of the political agenda of Christian Zionism. Absolutely. Thank you. Important. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to invite Rochelle Watson, National Organizer for Friends of Sabeel North America, to join us to speak on their upcoming action against Kufi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Deep appreciation to Sabeel for this conversation, to Stephen Sizer for your wisdom, for all of the speakers. I. Um, just wanted to briefly share that last summer we at FOSNA decided in the face of Trump's full support of Israel's ongoing land theft and the ways that Christian Zionism has clearly been setting um, the policies of our current administration in the region that it was time to take bold action. Uh, Christians United for Israel has claimed in the past year that they've gained three million members and we know as the Palestine Solidarity Movement here in the U.S. has uh, gained huge ground in the last few years that those in power are attempting to build the, the, the base of support that they're losing for, for um, uh, Israel through Christian Zionism. And so we decided um, after, after um, deep thought that we would, uh, for the first time, uh, take direct action and uh, come to DC where the Christians United for Israel Summit was occurring. Um, we had 200 folks come and participate in the action. We had a, a day of nonviolent training, uh, which was a really powerful experience in community building. And we then set out um, the morning of the summit um, with materials and just to bear witness to, to what uh, the misuse of our, misuse of our faith um, to provide cover for the occupation and um, Israeli apartheid. There were 25 of us that were able to uh, enter the summit and we managed to disrupt John Hagee and Mike Pence four times uh, and, and to expose Christian Zionism. And I'm gonna just quickly show you a, a one minute video of that inside action. 
if I can handle the technology, which is always a bit of a challenge. Let's see. Zionism is racism! Zionism! Zionism is racism! Israel demolishes homes! This year, we had planned to return to the summit that was scheduled to happen at the end of June, uh, but due to COVID-19, uh, Kuki has moved their summit online, and so we'll be holding a counter summit, a virtual counter summit. The theme for our action this year is Invest in Justice, which is lifting up the brilliant work of the movement for Black Lives that have been calling for the defunding of police and U.S. militarism and have named Israeli apartheid in their own platform. Um, and the need to move those funds to invest in justice and in community needs. Uh, we are currently in a historic moment after the murder of George Floyd by police in Minneapolis and the incredible upright, uprising that is underway um, that, that I feel like is, is, feels very much like it's just beginning. Uh, and so we see the struggle for racial justice here in the US is deeply connected to the struggle for Palestinian liberation. Um, we'll be launching a toolkit on Christian Zionism by the end of this month, encouraging and providing resources for folks to take action and to educate in their local communities. We're currently looking for team leads in cities across the US and also denominational leads for folks who wanna bring this work into their um, networks and communities. Um, the uh, the counter summit that we'll be hosting is open to all. Um, it will be on June 28th. There'll be a service um, at noon Pacific time, and then at 4 p.m. we'll be having an action, which will happen simultaneous to Kufi's opening act, uh, and we'll be taking action as we hear from speakers uh, and have a lot of cultural uh, components to it. So we hope you all will join us, and I'll put the link for more information uh, in the box. Um, in the chat box. We know that many of you on this call are located across the globe uh, and we just offer this small campaign as an example of the action that can be taken in all of our locations to counter Christian Zionism. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rochelle. That's uh, such powerful images coming from that action and such an important, um, such an important action and really looking forward to, to attending on June, in, on June 28th. Um, Thank you everyone for being with us today. Uh, next week, we will be joined by Jeff Halper. Uh, Jeff Halper is an Israeli anthropologist, the head of the Israel Committee Against House Demolitions, and the author of War Against the People, Israel, the Palestinians, and Global Pacification. He will let us know what can be done to help stop the use of home demolitions as a form of collective punishment. We hope to see you all back here next week. And if you like what you've seen today, we'd greatly appreciate it if you, if you would help spread the word to friends and family, classes and church groups and online through social media. Now we've reached the formal end of the meeting, but if you'd like to hang around, our guests have offered to answer questions and chat. We know people have a lot of other online meetings and responsibilities, so please don't feel obligated. But we'll be saying goodbye to anyone watching on Facebook at this time. And this will be the end of the recorded session. Thank you.